In the early 20th century, an epidemic infection left its victims often in a deep, deep sleep, and when they awoke, most were never the same. I'm your host, Dr. John Russell, and we are speaking with author Molly Caldwell Crosby about her book, Asleep, the forgotten epidemic that remains one of medicine's greatest mysteries. Molly, welcome to the program. Hi, thank you for having me. So this topic had a personal importance to you. Can you talk about that? It did. My grandmother was a survivor of the epidemic, and she was in Dallas, Texas in the 1920s. She was a a teenager, about 16 years old, and she came down with an infection and then fell into this deep sleep for 180 days. And then it was a long recovery after that. She was never able to finish school. She was physically weak and tired, and it left a lot of, similar to a mental disability, something about her was just not right from that point forward. And when I was a child, I would ask what was wrong with her or why she was different, and people would just always say she's been that way since the sleeping sickness epidemic. So I grew up hearing about it in that context and was always interested in learning more. So encephalitis lethargica might be recognized by our listeners from the Oliver Sacks book or movie, Awakenings. Yes. Did you, did you talk to Dr. Sacks at all about, this was what the Robert De Niro character in the movie suffered from this, correct? Yes, that's correct. And Robin Williams' character was based on Dr. Sacks. Yes, I did get the privilege to interview him in New York and ask him questions about that. And all, you know, his research was taking place in the 1960s. And still, all these decades later, I, I got the impression that it still haunted him, what these patients went through, the fact that they had survived this epidemic and then just been literally trapped inside of their bodies for another 40 years or so. Um, and then he's able to awaken them with L-DOPA because essentially what they found was the physical effects, the, the long-term physical damage from the encephalitis caused sort of a severe form of Parkinson's that literally froze them inside their own bodies. And so he wanted to try testing the new breakthrough drug L-DOPA on them and was able to awaken them for the first time. For themselves, for family members, they truly came back to life, but they were never able to keep them that way. The levels of the medication, the side effects would start to get too bad, or they couldn't maintain those high levels, and they all sort of slowly slipped back into that state. So I think even today it still really kind of haunts them whether or not it was better to have awakened them only to have them back in that state again afterwards. So you you quoted Dr. Sachs in your book, and you wrote, I would not imagine it possible for such patients to exist, or if they existed, to remain undescribed. So why do you think this was such an undescribed disorder? I think it really got lost in the wake of the 1918 flu. Cases of it started to break out during World War I among troops and different camps in Europe. And ultimately, they, they believe about 5 million people worldwide were affected by it in countries all over the world. So this was a global pandemic, but it was coming on the heels of the great 1918 flu, and that killed far many more people. Even today, there's still a, you know, a theory that it could be connected to that flu, that it could have been a neurological complication to catching the flu virus. You know, that's one school of thought today that they're still researching. And I think one of the reasons it's sort of forgotten is because it was never truly solved. It still remains kind of a medical mystery. We've never seen it in epidemic form again, but sporadic cases do exist around the world, and sort of a handful of specialists continue to monitor it. So how was it first described? What were the what were the first symptoms and signs that people were presenting to physicians with? For the most part, it was the deep sleep, although they had, in rare cases, people where it was just the opposite, people who could not ever fall asleep, extreme insomnia. But for most of the cases, it was a deep sleep coupled with some physical disabilities like Parkinson's, tremors, things like that, and then also some sort of personality, pronounced personality changes. In fact, this became so well connected to Parkinson's during that time period that the average onset for Parkinson's dropped to 36 years old because of this epidemic. So it was becoming so widespread in the wake of this encephalitis lethargica that Parkinson's was being seen, you know, in so many more places in such younger numbers than we see today. And then also the the mental changes were very, very pronounced in children. They think mainly because children's brains are not, especially the frontal lobe, it's not through growing at that point, but kids could become very violent 
just completely, they were described as monsters by some of the family members who knew them and physicians who treated them. Most of them ended up locked up in asylums. So it was a, a really terrifying disease for people, whether it affected their brain their physical movement or their personalities. It was horrifying. Was this just a United States phenomenon? No, they really did see cases throughout the world and in England. What London was pretty hard hit. Most anywhere they were seeing troop movements during World War One. They started to see this disease coming in the wake of the 1918 flu, and so they they followed it really all over the world during a decade-long pandemic. If you're just tuning in, we're speaking with author Molly Caldwell-Crosby about her book, Asleep, The Forgotten Epidemic. So who was von Economo? Constantine von Economo, he's a Viennese physician in, in Austria during the war, and he first starts to notice these patients. He's a neurologist. He sees them coming into the neurology clinic with just people coming in with bizarre symptoms, <laughs> everything from epidemics of hiccups to epidemics of schizophrenia, to movement disorders, to people who just are not staying awake, literally falling face forward into the dinner plates. And he starts to connect all of these together and realizes it's a form of encephalitis. The, the damage is being done to the basal ganglia in the brain. And as you know, <laughs> they're sort of a message center of the brain. And so it, it's causing these bizarre symptoms in all kinds of patients, and he's the first to identify them with the sleep, and he named it encephalitis lethargica, meaning the swelling of the brain that makes you sleepy, but it's also known to a lot of physicians as von Economos encephalitis because he named it. What really struck me is, is really had this disease helped kind of neurology develop as a discipline. You know, it really got a lot of dollars and got a lot of interest in neurology that there really wasn't beforehand, correct? It really did, especially in New York. Up to that point, a lot of American physicians had traveled over to study in a lot of the great clinics in Europe, in places like Austria, in Germany, in Paris. But after the war, a lot of that research slowed down, and it sort of was a window of opportunity for the U.S. to start expanding in neurology in particular. And they, there were a lot of great physicians coming out of New York at this time studying it. And this disease in particular was an interesting one because it was showing neurological damage. It was definitely related to neurology. But then the effect it's having on personalities starts to cross over into psychiatry. So there was, at the time, it was known as neuropsychiatry, and it was really sort of an interesting study of a disease that was affecting both neurology and psychiatry so equally. So this impacted J.P. Morgan's family, correct? It did. One of the most famous cases was J.P. Morgan's wife. She fell into the deep sleep, and about a third of the people did die in that sleep without ever waking. She was one of those, and he was devastated by the loss and ends up donating a large amount of money to the New York Neurological Institute to try to research and find out what was causing this disease. So what did the doctors of the day do to try to treat this? They really tried all, all kinds of things. This was sort of the height of the vaccine age, so there was a lot of vaccine research around it. But as the decade progressed, a lot of these cases, you know, as I said, about a third died, but a third who survived, survived with the severe disabilities. And so for a full 10 years, the, these asylums and psychiatric units, neurological institutes start filling up with patients who are chronic, who are needing long-term care, and they're not able to cure them. They're not able to do anything for them. And so they start being just sort of slowly locked up in these places um, all over the world, and that is how Oliver Sacks finds them 40 years later when he's working at a hospital in the 1960s. And it's interesting, and you really wrote that, for the most part, new cases seem to kind of disappear by the 1960s. Is that correct? That is correct. And so they don't know that some of the mystery without new cases to work on, the research really dried up in the 1930s and 40s. And then by the time, you know, Dr. Sachs comes around in the 1960s, it was a disease he'd never really even heard of, and most physicians had not by then. It was they'd never been able to pinpoint what caused the initial infection. They could never treat the patients or slow down the progression of the disease, and they never found a vaccine for it. And so many other, you know, great medical breakthroughs are happening in vaccine research at that time that it just sort of gets pushed aside and forgotten. And, and I know sometimes this gets ascribed to flu, but we continue to have flu epidemics 
you know, every year and we have pandemics every so often and we're still, we're not seeing this kind of reoccur. Are there other thoughts that maybe it's not flu, maybe it's a different infectious entity? There is still one group, I know here in Memphis at St. Jude, that are studying neurological complications from the flu, and particularly the really virulent strains like H5N1 in Asia, things like that, they'll start to see similar symptoms come from. So they do they do follow those outbreaks and see if they're seeing anything similar to encephalitis lethargica. But the other main school of thought was that it was related to the strep bacteria and that it could be triggered by a strep throat. Most of these patients who ended up with encephalitis lethargica first came down with symptoms that were sort of fever, aches and pains, and a sore throat. So it really could be strep or flu that was the initial trigger for the encephalitis. But whatever the initial one was, they've never pinpointed that exactly, and they just know that the encephalitis was sort of like an autoimmune response to whatever this lingering burning ember was. Yeah, and it's interesting, you know, so we started getting penicillin available to be used in patients in the United States about 1947. So maybe that would kind of speak to it kind of going away. We're probably over antibiotic at this point, but there really weren't antibiotics in the 1920s when all these cases no, took place. No, in some of the cases, some of the more current cases they've seen that the BBC did a documentary on outbreaks of this disease even in, in recent years and they've treated patients with antibiotics to try to treat whatever the initial infection if it's bacterial was um, and they've treated patients with steroids to see if they can slow down the, the swelling in the brain before it does any long-term damage and it's really been iffy sort of in some cases that is you know a miraculous cure and the patient recovers and in others it doesn't help. So it's still very mysterious um, and puzzling for doctors, I think. So did Disney get it wrong? Is this the basis for Sleeping Beauty? Was it, was it not kind of a... <laughs> there, yeah, there are thoughts that this is... Um, there have been epidemics of this throughout history. And there, uh, you know, there's thoughts that Sleeping Beauty, Rip Van Winkle, a lot of the stories were written around times that people were recording outbreaks of strange sleeping sicknesses in Europe throughout the world. So it's very likely was the inspiration for Sleeping Beauty and Rip Van Winkle. What do you think was the one most interesting thing you learned in researching this book? Hmm. I think probably uh, coming across and learning about the asylums where the children were held was both sort of horrifying but also fascinating that these, you know, entire colonies of children ended up in asylums where they had to spend the rest of their lives because they were violent, unmanageable, but they were able to set up these neat sort of communities for the children. It's not quite like the asylum you picture today. It was much more beautiful, pastures, people worked together. It was more like a small village. And the children did go on to live that way, you know, the rest of their lives. I was just shocked to sort of find that that existed, that it existed in the 1920s, and that it worked so well for so many people. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. It's really a wonderful book. I think I think something that kind of mainstream America really never learned about, and I think kind of a very fascinating kind of weaving of kind of epidemics and neurology and psychiatry and neurosurgery and so many of the things that we take for granted really woven with this very interesting infection. So thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. You've been listening to ReachMD Book Club. I'm your host, John Russell. To listen to this and other programs in the series, please visit ReachMD.com. Thanks for listening.